So let me, that's, uh, that's my sort of whirlwind tour through the last um, uh, 40 or some odd years of the industry. Uh, give you another whirlwind tour of SunPower. Uh, basically, um, we started working, as I mentioned, on concentrating systems. And in concentrating systems, uh, the, the efficiency of the converter is the key thing. You, if, you, uh, if you make a solar cell that's uh, twice as efficient but costs uh, 200 times more to make, if it's a regular solar cell, you've gone backwards, clearly. Uh, but if it's a concentrator cell and you then concentrate 500 times as much light on it, you've gone forward. So that was kind of the idea. And we rethought the solar cell, my students and I, uh, from top to bottom, uh, and, and went through where the losses are coming from in the cell and, and how do you redesign a cell where cost is not an object, okay? This looks for all the world like an integrated circuit when you look at it, which is what I did. You know, it has aluminum metal lines on the top, diffusions, vias, you know, that kind of stuff. Uh, but it had an array of N diffusions and an array of P diffusions on the back side. The light kind of comes in the bottom in this. We always uh, talked the top side was kind of the chip side and the bottom side was where the light came in. And um, I don't have time to go through all the technology of, of why this worked better, but we were able to make uh, uh, record concentrator cells uh, throughout that period. And um, we got involved in, this is, uh, this is uh, my research group. Uh, at one point, uh, we visited uh, PG&E. And PG&E, we were working with uh, building concentrator systems. This is an early concentrator system with uh, plastic Fresnel lenses. The chip, if you will, is at the back of that housing there behind each one of those little lenses. Uh, and so uh, at some, finally it got to the point where we had kind of done everything that made sense in a university uh, as far as the concentrator systems went, at least as far as I could uh, ascertain. And um, so it started SunPower uh, to commercialize this technology, take it out of the laboratory uh, into commercialization uh, in 1990. And we actually did make concentrator cells. Uh, we made them for a company in Australia called Solar Systems. This is one of their big dishes that they built. Uh, and you can see uh, uh, at the focus up there is a receiver that was filled with our little solar cells. Okay. So they were cramming 500 times uh, sunlight intensity up into that receiver and converting it to sunlight. This was a concentrator. Now most people, those of us who had worked on concentrators all our life thought this was a beautiful thing. This is a gorgeous thing. Most people, when they saw it, thought it was ridiculous. And uh, I, uh, you know, of course didn't think it was ridiculous, but um, uh, one day, uh, this, this thing, by the way, is 40 feet to the top there and uh, produced about 20 kilowatts. So we were going to install this system at Cypress Semiconductor and uh, it, uh, it would be taller than their three-story headquarter building. Okay. And we had to have a 150-foot exclusion zone around it because if it were off axis, it could burn up a car with its, uh, its reflected light. And, um, and then I suddenly had this, uh, this nightmare of having to go to the CEO of Cyprus, TJ Rogers, and tell him that I had just burned his car up. <laughs> and, uh, and then I had another nightmare, which is, uh, I really did have this nightmare uh, we were dedicating it in my dream, and some journalists were coming from the Mercury, and they were looking at this thing, which you could see throughout most of San Jose at this point, you know, if we had actually built it. And, um, and having the journalists say, so what fraction of the building does that actually power? And having to tell him, well, maybe 5%. And then having the journalists look at me like I had to be the stupidest guy on the planet, right? So I woke up <laughs> and uh, we decided to change. But uh, the way we could change is that Honda had come to us and said, we, we know you make the world's most uh, efficient solar cells. Can you make enough to power this race car across Australia and um, that we're going we're gonna to build? And we said, sure, although we'd never made anything in our lives. Uh, uh, being all a bunch of academics, uh, and that's a whole another fun story. But uh, we did actually uh, succeed finally with the help of Cypress Semiconductor, which saved our little uh, behinds. And uh, 
that started the relationship with Cypress. Uh, they helped us get into manufacturing. We built these cells and Honda went on to win the race across Australia. Here they are at the finish line by a day ahead of the second place car. And that kind of put SunPower on the map, okay? Put us on the map. Or at least we can do something right? other than burn up cars. And so NASA came to us and said, well, we know you build these good solar cells. Can you build enough to power this airplane? And we did that, which was a, uh, quite a much bigger project than the race car. Uh, and that, that gave us a lot of experience building non-concentrating cells. They were still cells pretty much built the same way as our concentrators, but uh, we tried to get the cost out. And the efficiency was quite good, and that was what enabled this solar-powered airplane to actually fly and set an altitude record. Uh, in fact, there's a solar-powered airplane now using our cells at Moffitt right now, the Solar Impulse, that's developed by a car, uh, and uh, that'll be taking off soon. So we, we at least had sort of an operating business. The problem with it was that uh, uh, the solar race was only every three years, and NASA only built uh, one airplane. So, you know, the business plan had to have a lot of sort of, uh, you know, miracle happens here kind of stuff in it. But, uh, uh, yeah. No, that's a remote, yeah, right. And it set uh, altitude records, it, you know, because it could go high because it didn't need uh, combustion air. Uh, there's only been one, um, one airplane that ever went higher. And if you're an airplane buff, you'll know about it. That was uh, Chuck Yeager in uh, the X-15, uh, where he actually shot out of the atmosphere uh, on a trajectory and flamed out the engines. And uh, so NASA has to distinguish that he went to about 120,000 feet, but that wasn't sustained level flight. <laughs> this one was. He, he shot out of the atmosphere. In fact, he, he crashed too. So, uh, <laughs> but anyway, he survived. But. Uh, uh, so <clears throat> NASA came to us and said, um, we like what you're doing, and we're going to build hundreds of these airplanes. Of course, we believed them. But uh, <laughs> however, it's a bit expensive. And so could you get the cost of these cells down? We were charging them $200 a watt, believe it or not, for those cells. So it's, it's a decent business. Um, they cost us about 100 to make, though. But we uh started working on the cell trying to get the cost out and started a project called project mercury which was uh, beyond our expectations uh successful uh, we much to our surprise discovered not only could we get a lot of cost out of the cell we could get enough out to compete with sharp which was then the number one we felt we felt and so uh in may of 2000 as a company we made this fateful decision to abandon concentrators put all of our eggs into the uh uh, high efficiency solar cell business. So we came, we came at solar cells from a high efficiency route trying to get the cost down. Everyone else in the industry now has come from a low efficiency route trying to get the efficiency up. They've come from a low cost, low efficiency. And we're kind of starting to converge a little bit. It'll be, it's an interesting battle that's uh, evolving here. We, uh, d we teamed up with Cypress Semiconductor where they brought their manufacturing know-how. And this was really key. Uh, I don't think people really appreciate how hard a solar cell is to make. You know, it looks simple, uh, so it's just a diode after all, but it um, has to be built in very high volumes. And, uh, and so we worked with Cypress engineers, and that was kind of fun. The, the, uh, you know, the Cypress engineers would come over and uh, they'd say things like, well, what are your design rules? You know, and uh, we'd say, well, 100 microns. And they'd say something like, well, you mean 100 nanometers, right? <laughs> no, 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 100 microns. And how many mass levels do you have? And we'd say three. You know? And they'd say, well, our chips have 20. <laughs> and, uh, and, by the, and then they start to glaze over and say, well, why are you even talking to this? I mean, we could solve all your problems over lunch. You know, this is not, this is, y your device is so simple. And then they would say, well, how many wafers are you going to start? And we'd say, well, our first factory we're planning on uh, when it's fully built out a million wafers a day. And they said, you mean a million wafers a year? Right? <laughs> no, a million wafers a day. A chip factory might do 100,000 or something right, in a year. Okay. So this, suddenly they got sucked in and they just loved it because the challenge of how you 
process a semiconductor-like device at that kind of volume is, is really fascinating. And, and you know, if you just start to do some back of the envelope, how do you even get the wafers into the fab at that rate? You know? And what if you break 10% of them? How long does it take to fill the entire fab with broken wafers before you're able to <laughs> shut the line down? I mean, it's, it's, this, is, this is interesting stuff. So we work with Cypress, and uh, they applied all of the hard learning that they had gotten or stolen from Intel and uh, <laughs> helped us uh, figure out how to make the solar cell. And it worked fantastically. This shows the, the backside and the front side, all the contacts on the backside, et cetera. And we built our first factory in the Philippines. Uh, this is the uh, then president of the Philippines. Uh, if you ever, <coughs> the, the, the short lady there, uh, it, if you want to have fun sometime, watch watch somebody like that get into a clean room suit with 20 uh, Secret Service guards standing around with uh, automatic weapons trying to get into their own clean room suits too. <laughs> but anyway, we managed to do it, and uh, and uh, then then we went public. Uh, and and you know, I think uh, this changed the game so much. People don't quite realize it when when Arco Solar started to see the market taking off, was really Shell by then, uh, the market taking off, the people at Shell said, you know, we've got to expand. We have 50 megawatts down here in Camarillo per year. We think that's going to be left in the dust. We'd like to add 20. And it would go to Shell, and it would get on their agenda for the next board meeting. That would take a year. We'd go to the board meeting. The Shell as senior board members would say, photo what? And reject it. They went through several of these cycles to get 20 megawatts on. Okay, suddenly the public was not so timid, uh, and Cyprus was not so timid. Cyprus uh, plunked down 150 million for us to build that factory in the Philippines, which at that time was far beyond anything a venture capitalist was capable of. And when we decided we needed to expand uh, the factory, um, it took us about a week to make that decision. It took our CFO three days to go to New York and come back with $300 million. So there's less than two weeks, OK? Compare that to Shell, two years. They had 20 megawatts. We got the money to add 500 megawatts in, in, in less than two weeks. So the big companies couldn't really play this game. This was a new, a new game for entrepreneurial companies. <laughs>